this video is about a product called White Lightning. White Lightning is a fourth based high level graphics development system for the Commodore 64 that is based on the 1980 release one of Fig Fourth. Fig being the fourth interest group. According to its manual, it is aimed primarily at the user who has commercial games writing in mind and has the patience to learn a sizable new language. Software produced with White Lightning can be marketed without restriction. This came out in 1984. What's really awesome about this software product is that you can create software and sell it or redistribute it to users without paying Oasis or royalty, and the users don't need to own a copy of White Lightning to run it. So this is really cool. Uh, the version of Forth that comes in this is written by someone named Stuart Smith, who I'm pretty sure is the same guy that wrote the Adventure Construction set. And his name can be found by an interesting kind of an Easter egg. If you type in hex 2229, count type it'll print out his name his name appears in the dictionary of words which we'll get more into that later uh, but it's unlinked so you're able to actually look at it and print the name out but it doesn't seem to serve any purpose other than it just being in the binary in this video we're gonna learn about fourth but we're gonna do it in a very fun way we're gonna learn fourth by writing programs that use graphics and sounds this is a series of video where each one is going to focus on maybe one or two specific topics. I'm going to try to keep each video under 20 minutes or so. These videos will cover purely the disc version of White Lightning for the C64. There is a tape version and it's slightly different. Uh, I don't have that version, but it would be kind of fun to play with. I believe there's a version of this product also out for the ZX Spectrum 48K. Sorry, ZX Spectrum 48K. I've never used that machine. I don't know much about it, but I'm curious to see how different it is than the 64 version. Um, I would love to play around with it. I don't know if there's like a Vice emulator equivalent for the ZX Spectrum. It'd be kind of neat to try one out. All the source code and everything you see in this video is going to be on the GitHub link that you're going to find in the video description below. White Lightning supports one and only one disk drive, and it must be a 1541. It doesn't even have printer support, although I'll show you how to get around that later on. The manual that comes with this must have been really intimidating to users at the time. The first chunk of it's very technical and the average user I'm guessing had no idea what it was talking about and probably just closed it, put it back in a box and threw it in her shelf. Uh, but if you get further into it, there's actually a really good tutorial on fourth and I give you some references to other books that are out there, like uh, the really excellent Starting Fourth by Leo Brody, which you can get in PDF pretty much anywhere on the internet today. It is a really good book. I do think the product did a little bit of a disservice to itself by not providing better documentation or examples on how to do other things you'd want to do, like reading and writing files, controlling the printer, uh, even using the random number generator, and enabling error messages instead of error numbers. They do reference hit little hints to these features throughout the manual, but don't worry, I'm going to cover each of those items in detail in upcoming videos. What's really neat about this language is it's very interactive, kind of like basic. You can just keep working on it and testing parts of your code, and the cycle is really, really quick. It's both interpreted and compiled, although we're going to spend the first section working with the interpreter. The power of the language will really show itself when we learn how to compile and create our own words and extend the system and create more words that work upon words. It's awesome. But before we get to any of the graphics and sound, there is a very base level of fourth that we need to know. So I'm going to show you just the absolute bare bones required knowledge of fourth before we get into graphics. So let's cold start environment by typing cold. And let's write our first program in fourth in white lightning. And we're going to write the obligatory hello world program. So we start by typing cr.quote hello world. CR. And here it prints hello world. So what are we looking at? Well, in fourth, each command is called a word, and a word is a compiled piece of code. And the first word that we've run here is CR, and that just presses carriage return for us. That moves the cursor to the beginning of the next line. The next word is dot quote, which prints text that's to the right of it. And the way dot quote works is it looks for any text up until it sees a quote again and prints that to the screen. And as you can see here, it printed hello world. And then after that, we have another CR to put the carriage return to the next line. And that OK prompt that we see there tells us that these commands ran all fine. There was no problems. Everything was OK with it. Now let's break this down by using some colors here. The text in green 
are the words. Again, the compiled pieces of code that do a thing. The yellow are the space that you must have between each word or parameters. So dot quote is the next word in green, but there has to be a space before the parameter starts. That's where it starts reading the word hello world from. So putting that carriage return, you can clearly see that it's not printing that space that's in between the quote and the H. A very common bug is to forget that space. There's a space and there's a CR, and of course, uh, there's a hello world. So what about error messages? What happens when things go wrong? So let's type a word that I know is not in the system, and that's the word Commodore. The way error messages work is it shows you the word that had a problem running, right? Didn't know what Commodore was, and that's where the question mark is. It's kind of like a shrug. And message number zero means the word is not defined in the dictionary. Now, unfortunately, the default configuration white lightning, instead of giving you actual textual messages, is giving you numbers. And the manual contains a list of these error messages by number. However, there is a way to put messages into the system, and we'll cover that later on. So now let's talk about numbers. So we tried words. Let's try number. If I type in one, two, three, four, which is also a word that's not in a dictionary, instead of getting a message zero, it just says, okay. Well, in fourth, there's really two types of things that the system cares about, words and numbers. So when it goes to the dictionary looking for that one, two, three, four as a word, it doesn't find it in a dictionary. And then it looks at it and says, does it look like a number? It is. If it's a number, it puts it onto what's called the stack. As your program runs, there's an internal stack that you can manipulate. A stack is a first item in, is a last item out data structure. And the stack in fourth contains only 16-bit numbers. No 8-bit numbers, no 32-bit numbers. I'll put an asterisk in my last comment there. Uh, just 16-bit numbers. And a 16-bit number can contain a value, if it's signed, between negative 32768 and positive 32767. Unsigned number between 0 and 65535. Both of those kinds of numbers are just 16-bit values. So the only difference in the two is how they're displayed on a screen. So with 1, 2, 3, 4 in a stack, what can we do to, to see it? There's a word that's just a dot, which is kind of like print number from stack is what I like to call it. And if you press enter, it goes to the stack, it pops that number off and displays it on the screen. Now, if we were to run this command again, you're probably expecting some kind of error message, but instead it prints a zero followed by okay. That's because when a message occurs, it puts the message number onto the stack and that's what the zero is. If I run dot again, I get whatever garbage is in memory followed by error number one. This shows an error while executing the dot word. And it says, hey, there's nothing on a stack for me to pull out to display. So let's do some kind of cool stuff with this. What if I want to change the border color of the screen, right? So if I put a two onto the stack, which for Commodore usually means the color red, and I'm going to use a word called T border, it makes the border red. And the way the word T border works is it pulls the number off the stack and makes up the border color. There's also one for paper. So we'll use seven, which should be yellow, right? We can pass that to paper, T paper, there we go. It makes the screen yellow. There's a word for changing a cursor color and they call that ink. And if I pass a nine to the word ink, I get this kind of brown color here. So numbers are nice. Um, and if you know those numbers by heart and anyone's had a Commodore for a number of years, probably has at least zero through eight memorized uh, as to what colors they are, but not everyone does. That concept of that number of just being a thing that we know about, uh, we generally call those magic numbers. Like I magically know that two is red and one is white and zero is black, but we can assign words to those numbers. And when we do that, they're called constants. So included in white lightning are 16 constants, one for each color. So if I type in, for example, brown, and I press dot to print it onto the screen, you'll see that number nine come out. So a constant is a word that's in a dictionary and all it does is put that number onto the stack for us. So let's try this out and see if we can get a better looking screen. We're gonna make our border gray one. We're gonna put black on a stack and make that the color of the paper. We're gonna put a lighter gray onto the stack and make that the color of the ink. And there we go. So let's introduce another new word here, the word key. This word will pause the computer and wait for the user to press a key. When they do, the ASCII value is placed onto the stack. So unlike T border and T paper. This word doesn't consume an item from a stack. It puts something onto the stack. So let's type in key space dot. This will wait for a key to be pressed. We'll press it and then dot will pull it off the stack and print it. So we'll press enter. 
and as you can see, it's it's waiting for us to press a key. I'll press the A key and it prints the number 65. 65 is the ASCII value of A. Well, how is this useful? Well, if we know the ASCII value of some of the control keys from the Commodore 64, like reverse on and off, uh, we can use them in our code. So let's try key dot again. And this time we're gonna press control nine, which would normally turn reverse video on. And here we see the number 18. So let's introduce another new word called emit. Emit takes a value off the stack that's an ASCII value and prints it on the screen. So we're gonna do an 18 space emit. That's gonna pull the reverse on key off the stack and, and press it for us. And then we'll mix it with dot quote, hello in reverse. And there we've got some reverse video. And now you'll notice that when the command is done, it turns off reverse video for us, which is kind of nifty. Now, if we wanted to clear the screen, normally you just press clear home and it clears the screen for you. If we use the key and the dot to capture that command, so I'm gonna press clear home, we get the number 147. Now here's something really interesting. If I emit that 147, all it does is move the cursor to the top of the screen. Let me do it down here just to kind of demonstrate it better. All right, so built in, they capture that 147 and they purposely do not clear the screen with it, which I think is interesting. I'm not quite sure what the reason why is, uh, but I'm sure it has something to do with the split screen modes that we'll look at later when we get into graphics. But don't worry, there's a way around that. So there's another word in a dictionary called CHR out. This behaves just like emit. However, instead of going through White Lightning's interpreter to capture the text and display it, this goes straight to the kernel of the C64. There are a number of words that they put into the dictionary that are interfaces to the C64 kernel, which is really nice. But in any case, we can use this to clear the screen. So I'm gonna write screen should be cleared. And this here actually clears the screen. So every so often emit's not good enough. And if you're trying to do some kind of full text programs, you may need to do chr out instead and just go right to the kernel. But for the most part, you probably should stick with emit. It's usually a good idea to use the built-in APIs because there's usually a pretty good reason why they're doing the restrictions that they do. So we've used constants. How do we create our own constants? So there's actually a word to create words that are constants and it's called constant. Let's create a constant called unlucky and assign it the value of 13. So again, with numeric values, you always push numeric values onto the stack. We call a word called constant, and then we put the name that we want to create next to it. I'm going to call it unlucky. This is an interesting word that all consumes a value from the stack and has a text parameter at the same time. And the text parameter that constant looks for is just a word. So now we have created a word called unlucky and it's available for us to use. So now we can just type in unlucky space dot and there we go, we get a 13 that comes off the stack. Constants are great if we just want to assign a word to a number that never changes. But if we're making game, we need a way to read and write values, you know, like a score. So what we want to do is we want a way to create a word that we can assign it a value and then be able to read and write from it. And we do that with something called a variable. So we're going to create a variable called score and we're going to initialize it to zero. So we throw the zero onto the stack. There's a new word called the variable and then we're gonna create a variable called score. Now you might think that you read a variable just like a constant. So you might say, oh, score dot. But instead of getting the number zero, we get some seemingly random number, in this case, 18277. What we are seeing is the memory address of where the value is stored in memory. So we need to combine this with another word that takes that memory address and fetches the value out of it and puts that on a stack. And that word is an at sign. Whenever you see the word at sign, instead of think of the word fetch. So here we would do score at sign. So what happens is score puts the memory address on the stack. At sign goes to memory address 18277 and pulls the value out of it, and puts that onto the stack instead. Then when you can use dot to print it. Now, let's say we want to do the opposite. We want to put a new value into score. So we put the new value on the stack. We put in the word score, which is going to return 18277, the memory address and then we use an exclamation point and we press enter. And now if we type in score at dot, we get the value 100 back. So this can be read as 100, place the value 100 on the stack, score, place the memory address on the stack, exclamation point, which we're gonna use the word store in our mind. So think of the word store, that's going to take the memory address off the stack 
that 18 to 77, and put the value 100 in it that's also on the stack. So again, whenever you see the word exclamation point, think of the word store. Understanding the difference between constants and variables is tremendously important in fourth. So you really want to take some time now, especially if you're following along on your own, and practice this. Create some variables, create some constants, uh, learn how to change the value of variables, and get a really good grasp on that. When we move into the next section of code where we work with graphics, understanding those two simple concepts is humongous. So at this point, we know enough fourth to actually work with graphics. So not too bad. It didn't take a whole lot to get here, but those fundamentals that we have now will let us interoperate with the graphic system. But before we do that, we need to take a little bit of a turn here and discuss how do we manage source code. And we will cover that in the next video. See you shortly.